Welcome to Martial Arts Today Television. I'm your host, Joe Ribello, and we're here today with a very special guest. And I have to say, this is a gentleman who I've wanted to interview for uh, going on at least 30 years, uh, since the early days of his articles in Inside Kung Fu Magazine. Uh, a legend in this country, in the art of Bagua Zhang, the eight trigram palm internal system of Kung Fu, Shu Fu John Painter. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Oh, it's I greatly a pleasure. appreciate it. Well, the first question I ask all my interviewees is, how did you begin in the martial arts? Oh, my goodness. How, lo how long do we have here? <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't ever decide to be in the martial arts. Um, I was very ill as a child. And my um, mom and dad had taken me to all sorts of um, doctors and specialists and so on. I lived in East Texas. Uh, and they said, we doubt that this kid is going to make it to the age of 15. He's got all sorts of problems. <clears throat> He's always getting sick. His immune system is not functioning properly. I was in bed maybe every other week with some kind of a fever or something like that. I could have been the boy in the bubble, you know? And so I was in bed one day and ill, out, staying out of school. And my dad came in and said, we have to go. My dad was a football player for Texas University back when they wore leather helmets, wow. that's way back, you know. <clears throat> and he said, Anna Brooks, our normal lady that stays with you and your sister while we're gone to the football game in Dallas, it was a Texas OU football game thing, a big, big rivalry. Um, so we're going to have somebody come over and stay with you. And I said, well, who's that going to be? And he said, well, it's old Mr. Lee from next door. Old Mr. Lee from next door? Yeah, he's a nice guy. I said, yeah. Um, is he the guy that lives next door? Yeah. Well, Dad, he's nuts. Well, how do you know that? Well, I've been up late at night, you know, sometimes I can't sleep. And I've seen somebody, and I assume it's who it is, in the backyard next door, <clears throat> over the hedge, in the dark, running around in a circle around a big pine tree and he's wearing like a robe or something i said the guy's nuts i don't want him to he said i'm sorry you know we helped him get here he moved over here from from uh china and we helped him get set up in his restaurant and he doesn't have anything going right now so they're going to stay with you and your sister okay <laughs> so i'm hiding under the covers and the door, like in a bad horror movie, <laughs> you know, opens up, right? And in comes this little guy, probably five foot eight, maybe, maybe 170 dripping wet, in a Pendleton shirt, you know, a little, like a lumberjack thing, and khaki pants, and little shoes, <clears throat> loafer type things, or, or like um, a deck shoes kind of thing. And I'm like, oh my God, what is happening here? So he comes over to me. And he grabs my hands, both of them, and starts holding my pulses, which I didn't know right. squat about pulses. And he goes, okay, hmm, I tell you, you're not to feel good. I said, yeah, I, I, um, I feel fine. He said, no, no, you sick. I said, okay. He said, I'm making you something. So he goes out, comes back with some kind of soup with stuff floating in it. So I ate a little of it, you know, and it, it tastes pretty good. It was a chicken something, you know, like an old Jewish grandmother, you know, chicken <laughs> soup, right? <clears throat> so I said, okay, fine. So I laid down and waited a while, and then he comes back the next morning. And my sister was off at the grandmother's, and he comes in, he says, you come over next door. I show you something special. I said, okay. He said, I show you something to make you very healthy. I said, okay. So I follow him out, you know, after I got dressed into the backyard, and he s takes me up to this huge, big, big uh, like a lodgepole pine standing in his backyard. And he says, you stand there like this. And he puts my feet together, and he adjusts them, and he moves my knees, and he, dress and he pushes my head up, and he drops my shoulders down, and then he makes me like I'm hugging the tree. But I'm not really hugging the tree, I'm just looking at it. He says, you look at the tree. I said, okay, I'll look at the tree. Fine. He's gone, <laughs> you know. And I'm standing here looking at this tree like an idiot. 
and I hear him from inside the porch, a little screened in porch. And he goes, look at the tree. I said, uh, I'm looking at the tree. I see an ant climbing up. He said, just look, just be still. Okay. This is ridiculous. You are not want to learn, go home. Okay. <laughs> <I went back. laughs> that was that. This was my first introduction, introduction to Jamjong or standing practice. And I thought he was out of his mind uh, from the beginning. <clears throat> so next afternoon, he comes and he says, I show you something else. I said, I'm not looking at that tree. He says, okay, I show you something else. So he takes me to the back and he's got these concrete steps and he had three, I think four, four building bricks, the kind they make streets out of, you know, around here in New Bedford, you know, the old, old hard stuff. I mean, we're not talking baked in the oven kind of thing. We're not talking holes in them. We're talking solid last 500 year bricks. And he has them stacked up on the back porch like that. And he says, you pick a one. I said, okay, uh, that one, the middle one. So he leans over and he puts his palm about this high from it and he takes a little breath like that and the middle one shattered. And I went like, oh my God, how did you do that? I mean, he's a little skinny, you know. How did you do that? What, what, what? How? He said, I can show you. I said, you can show me? Yes, I show you. I said, very hard exercise, he says. I said, hmm, okay, I'll do anything to learn how to do that. Push-ups, we're going to do chin-ups, going to get out the barbells in my, in my closet, you know, what, what are we going to do? He says, no, look at the tree. And that was it. He wanted me to look at the tree to gain internal power, he says. So I looked at the damn tree <laughs> for a long time, every day. I'm thinking I was going to get this ability to shatter a brick. Well, of course, I didn't, you know, from that. But he tricked me, kind of like, you know, painting the fence, you know, <laughs> with Mark Twain, right? And after a while, I started getting better. I started not getting as sick, I didn't get as uh, ill, and he showed me different postures to hold while I was standing here supposedly drawing energy off of this tree. So he keeps doing this with me, and my mom and dad took me back to the clinic in uh, Shreveport to get interviewed and looked at again, and the doctor says, well, a lot of the stuff that was wrong with him is gone now. What's, what's he doing? What, are you all doing something else? And my dad said, no. The little guy next door is giving him herbs and stuff and is having him do stuff in the backyard, exercises. And the doctor says, I don't know what it is, but tell him to keep doing it. And so here, 72 years later, I'm sitting here, you know, now in front of you because of this little guy who was a trainer in Chiang Kai-shek's army and was a, a personal bodyguard um, and had a, had a company that were bodyguards called Baobiao. On the, um, on the Silk Road stuff, you know, in trucks and so on. And he and his dad were famous for their uh, skills with their Chinese martial arts, Chuan Fa, not the word Gong Fu we never heard. They always was Chuan Fa. Uh, and, and their broom handle Mauser pistols. They were excellent ex marksmen with those as well. So that's kind of how I got started. And then I didn't really want to go into martial arts. I just kept practicing what he showed us. Another boy, um, Robert Cotton and uh, Steve Payne came in <clears throat> and started practicing with us in the backyard. Uh, Steve died eventually of a heart condition when he was really young and Robert went off to Japan and started making Godzilla movies or something and he quit practicing so I was the only one left. Little did I know that my teacher's name was Li Long Dao. Uh, they just, we just called him Frank Lee. Um, Little did I know that he, when they had moved here to the United States, he wanted his son to assume the lineage of his family's yeah. art that had gone on for over 400 years. And his son was interested in girls, football, and cars in that order, and had no desire to follow in dad's footsteps. So basically, Li Lung Dao taught me what he did that saved my life to spite his son. <laughs> I'll teach it to the guy low. <laughs> yes. I'll teach it to the white guy. I'll I'll that's exactly devil. what he did. I'll teach it to the foreign but, devil. Wow. And, and his, his son now will speak to me. He wouldn't for 20 or 30 years. 
but just recently, at my sister's husband died, and just recently at the funeral, a young Chinese guy came up to me and tapped me on the shoulder, and I turned around and he said, are you John Painter? They used to call you Biff Painter. I said, yes, that's who I am. He said, I, I want to ask you a question. I said, fine, sure, whatever. He said, my father admitted to me or told me that you and my grandfather <clears throat> used to destroy his restaurant after hours, throwing each other over tables and stuff. And I said, are you David's son? Yeah. He said, I didn't believe any of that. I said, it's true. He said, Grandma said so, and now, Dad, so now I've met you. I said, you want to learn what your grandfather taught me? Come, it's all yours. I'll give it all to you. Wow. I haven't heard from him since, but we hope, you know, that one day that'll happen. There you go. So I got out. You asked me about how I got started. So no, I'm that's carrying on. Sorry. There you go. No problem. Um, I had no desire to do any of that except to keep myself healthy. When I got into theater in college, um, I wanted to have a career in showbiz and, and do films and plays and so on. I did use a lot of this information that I had to um, direct uh, fight scenes in Shakespeare and so on, swords and all that kind of thing. Um, and then later I became a bodyguard for some legal people and some non-legal, <laughs> by legal, non-legal I mean nefarious characters, so to speak. Um, and that kind of led into another career which led into something else which eventually I said, you know, I just need to teach people what I've learned. And I opened the first school, which was the first Chinese martial arts school in Texas. Wow. And that's over 50, 46 years ago. So, wow. yeah, that's, and that's kind of how I got into it. Well, again, uh, th throughout the world, you are known for your study in the art of Bagua, mm -hmm. Bagua Zhang. And for our viewers, uh, Bagua Zhang, or for those people <coughs> who read earlier Crown Wilkes translations, Pakwa Chang, yeah. you may know it as, <laughs> uh, translates as the eight, eight trigram palm. And many people know of the eight trigrams <coughs> through uh, the classic book, The I Ching, The mm -hmm. Book of Change. And uh, everyone has studied the understanding of uh, geomancy through things like, like Feng Shui and the study of the, the different combinations of these trigrams. Well, you're well studied. That's uh, great. <laughs> even to the Beatles throwing three coins to read their fortunes. You uh -huh. know, but, uh, so, so tell me about Bagua. Tell me about how you got involved through Master Lee through Bagua and, and your orientation of Bagua and all of well, that. Well, the Lee family developed their own version of martial arts. Um, they started off as farmers and stuff, and somehow they ended up meeting this guy who, oddly enough, was a Tibetan. And he had traveled all over China and had been looking at, this is in the 1500s, and had developed his own kind of ideas about martial arts. So he had sort of made a distillation of the concepts of movement. And he called it the five circles, the six stances, and the four virtues. And that was his whole system, these three things. And so that's what the first thing they learned. And it was all different kinds of hand positions using these five circles and with six basic stances, which is what every Chinese martial arts, every Japanese martial art, every Korean martial art uses either some or all of these stances. They have different names, but they use some or all of them. Over the years, they began to incorporate various methods um, as uh, Xing Yi Chen, or um, the five element fist, came into play. They adopted that into their system. And as Taiji Chen came in, they adopted that into their system. And then the last one they adopted was Ba Guazang. Um, ba is eight, Gua is diagram, and Zang means palm. And it's a combative and health system that's designed to use the palm instead of the fist. And it's major method is walking in circles. People don't understand why that is. Well, it does a lot of different things. But one of the things it does is produces tremendously dynamic footwork that allows you to weave in and out of multiple opponents. Because Bhagavad Zang's original concept was for bodyguards in the palace. 
um, and they were able to maneuver in and around posts and people and groups of people and deal with multiple opponents. Where most martial arts take one guy at a time, they deal with two and three and four, which later on, by the way, was ideal for us teaching uh, prison guards and so on. And we've taught most of all the prison guards in Ohio and many other states a version of Bhagwan Zong, not the whole thing, because it's a very complex methodology. But um, the Bhagwan Zong is a fairly new art. Mm. There's a lot of controversy as to who created Bhagwan Zong exactly. Um, so there's any number of different stories. And since most of the records have been burned, nobody knows for sure. History is written by the conquerors, you yes. know. Revisionist history. One right. <laughs> well, Lee family insisted that um, a fellow named, this is where it gets kind of funny, um, Li Qingyun brought Bagua Zhang to them. He was a cousin. And Li Qingyun is famous for having reputedly lived to be 250 years of age. He only really lived to be about 100, but in the time period when average age was 50 and 45. That's a pretty darn good, you know, lifespan. The way they, it came out that he was 250 was that in that period of time, many of the people would actually usurp their father's birth certificate so that they were about 50 years older than they claimed. And this allowed them to be elderly, so they got a stipend from the government. <laughs> That's kind of dealing with the you know, with the government to get a little extra money. And we think Li Ching Yun probably did that. But he was a member of this Li family's group. And he had a method he called dancing like a dragon or Long Wu Dao, which appears to be a similar thing to Dong Hai Chuan, who created mm -hmm. Bagua Zhang supposedly, method. So there's all these divergent ideas. Um, the Bagua Zhang that we practice came from this Lee family group. Uh, it has a health side which contains uh, health benefits, what you would call Qigong, they called it Dao Yin nah. in the early days. Um, Qigong is a relatively new term also. Mm -hmm. And then that has the Jiangang or martial application concepts. It was never designed like what you see in tournaments today to be a sport. It was designed as a rough and tumble martial skill that allowed you to defeat multiple opponents in a very short amount of time, what we would call today in the military CQB or close quarter battle. Yeah. Um, and so it was, uh, that's what it was. And it, it became mine because the second thing that Li Qingyun asked me to, do, I'm not Li Qingyun, sorry, Li Longdao asked me to do after looking at the tree was to start walking around the tree. Now, this is an interesting fact that most Bhagwazang people do not know. I spent about 10 years with a group of scientists, physicians, doctors, urologists, neurologists, psychologists, and so on, looking into all the reasons why, and this is going to upset all of my Taiji friends, <laughs> why Bhagwazang people that walk the circle seem to live longer and are healthier than anybody else in the martial arts. Well, there's two reasons. One, you do it slowly in the beginning. But two, you do it a little faster as you get better, so it has an aerobic benefit, which Taiji Chen is a great art, but it doesn't have that. Three, there's a very strange part of our brain, which is sometimes laughingly known among physicians as the compass in the nose. There are little crystals in the ethmoid sinus and they were used by our ancestors for direction finding, like a compass. They actually point north. This is a little known, but it's a scientific fact. They actually point north all the time. So if you turn, the crystal turns to point north. Our ancestors on the veldt, you know, would use this to find their way back home, just like pigeons and dolphins and so on do. And we still have this. You have it, I have it, we all have it. Natural. Now, think about this. All these different cultures, ancient cultures, had some kind of spiritual or religious practice in which they walked or danced or spun in circles. Aha. What we discovered by actually hooking up subjects to a brainwave scan and having them walk linearly and turn or then start walking in circles, 
is that when you circle walk for a specific period of time, about three to five minutes, at the end of five minutes, your brainwave patterns go down to right at the cusp of an alpha state. So it creates a form of altered consciousness. And what happens is blood pressure lowers, heart rate slows down, the vagus nerve calms, so the intestines get quiet, and it's like meditating, only walking. And this is where you see the Bhagavad Zang people a lot of times will be walking, holding a posture yes, or something and, and not doing anything. They're not sure why it's doing that, but that's what it's doing. And this actually seems to slow or help slow down the aging process somewhat. So we're still doing research on this, but that's something that's little known in the, in the martial arts community, that particular concept. And it was that that seemed to calm me down when I was young doing this circle walking and so on. Because my mother suffered from biochemical depression. So did I. And as I got older, I stopped practicing when I was in high school, in college, for about the last year of high school and the first two years of college. And I medicated my depression with alcohol. I would leave college and go off into Mexico and get in fights and all sorts of stuff. Um, got in all sorts of problems. But I found out what works and what doesn't in the martial arts <laughs> pretty easily. So On job training. That's there what you know. happened. Wow. Well, first of all, for our viewers, uh, the, uh, the study of the internal Chinese martial arts, which were mentioned previously, um, Tai Chi Chuan or Tai Chi Chuan is uh, the, the grand ultimate or the universal totality. Uh, again, uh, Chuan means fist. It refers to pugilism. Uh, but it's one of the internal martial arts. Second, uh, Xing Yi, or some people refer to the older term, uh, another term, Xing Yi, uh, is the intellectual mind fist. It's uh, five element fist, 12 animal forms. Uh, I decoratively call it Chinese internal Shotokan. Mm -hmm. It's straight line right on and it blows right through you. Uh, if you ever want to see a depiction of Bagua versus Xing Yi, the classic Jet Li film, The One, which ironically I was joking with Dwayne Johnson about he was the original person that was supposed to be cast in that film and Jet Li ended up taking the movie over. Uh, and then of course Bagua, which we talked about previously. Oh, and of course, we got to throw. We, we got to allude to the fourth unofficial internal martial art, uh, Liu Ho Bafa. Liu Ho Bafa, says, yes. Uh, li, six mm -hmm. harmony, water six boxing. harmony, eight methods, eight methods, technique, water boxing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, now, um, you know, again, I'm I'm familiar with your career through obviously, and we've got to make the the rampant plug for the uh, sadly now defunct <laughs> Inside Kung Fu magazine. And way back in the 1980s, mm -hmm. um, you became a very prolific author and uh, um, a writer of numerous articles. Mm -hmm. What was the impetus to start writing articles about Kung Fu? You know, that wasn't really my intention at first. Um, my school opened before Inside Kung Fu Magazine actually started. Right. And it, it also started about two or three months before the first TV show of, of Kung Fu on TV with David Carradine showed up. Um, when this magazine came out, um, I started looking at it and I thought, wow, this is interesting, you know, I wonder if I could write something for them. So I wrote one article and the editor, I don't recall who the editor was at that time, the well, last Curtis, editor was Dave Cater, but this was... The first one would have been still Curtis Wong. Yes, who, Curtis Wong. The publisher yeah. of the magazine. And, and uh, he liked what I had written and asked me to do more. So I tried to do something about every three or four months and write a little something about it because there wasn't very much information out there that was trying to explain what these internal things are outside of it being mystical. And my whole focus was always, let's do this, let's keep it real, let's be practical, let's get rid of the buzzwords, and let's just try to explain how these things can actually benefit people. And that's been my career ever since. Well, you know, I, I like I said, I grew up on these articles. I grew up, and uh, one of the one of the articles we were talking about previously, and I want to allude to again, in one of your early articles, you had this, this two beautiful depictions, two wonderful illustrations. One was of a samurai, and the other was of my personal favorite, uh, Guang Yu, Guang Gong, yeah, Guang Tai, Gong. Mm -hmm. General Quan from the Three Kingdoms yeah. period in the Song Dynasty, and it what was a character. Quite a character, what an incredible illustration, and I have to fess up that I found that illustration so beautiful that I had it colorized, and I, <laughs> and I literally place it on every one of my Chinese martial arts certificates. How great. It is just an incredible. Talk to me about the illustration and the article, which you decoratively called Zen and the Art of Murder. Yes. Talk to me about Yes, this. we called it Zen and the Art of Murder. Um, well, the art, the, I can't remember the name of the artist, but he was one of my students. 
that did the artwork for it. And I, I'm sorry, but I'm bad with names no. sometimes after that far back. Sure. But um, he did an amazing job with those. Phenomenal. Just gorgeous pen and ink kind of drawings. Um, that article was written because I kept seeing all these articles that talked about, you know, uh, violence and so on and so forth, and then there would be people write into the magazine and say, oh, you know, well, you're, you're talking about um, uh, being uh, violent and killing people. And I said, well, Zen and the art of murder, Zen actually means meditation, all right? That's the Japanese term for it. Um, and when you look at it, these things were done in what the Chinese would refer to as a state of wu wei. Yeah. Okay, wu wei translates as doing nothing that's not spontaneous. Mm -hmm. Doing whatever happens at the moment is completely spontaneous. And the whole point of the article rested around a story, um, but it, it took into account Budo, the Japanese concepts. It took into the account of wu de, which is the Marshall Chinese Marshall. concept of um, basically how to treat people and how to act properly, um, having morals. Martial virtue. Martial virtue, that's what it means. And so the story was based around one that we were told as kids about the founder of the system, the Lama I told you about. His name was Zerdwan. And the story goes that he was out traveling with his long sword. He had this long sword he kept on his back. He had learned this somewhere in the, in the mountains in, um, I think it was uh, Szechuan. And he was traveling and he came upon this group of people. And they noticed him and they figured he was a shaman. Okay. So they said they wanted to talk to him about philosophy. And they started talking to him about philosophy and so on. And he's telling them, yes, you know, you're talking about violence and so on. And, you know, it's not a good thing. Wars are bad. People get into violence and so on. It's not the right thing to do. And, you know, killing people is, is not good. It, it, you know, causes heartache for years thereafter and so on. And as he just was speaking, they were sitting by the fire. A bandit leaped off of the rock behind him, and two came from around the sides. And in one movement, according to the story, he drew this long sword, spun around, took the head off the bandit, flicked the blood off, put it back, and sat back down before the body actually hit the ground. And looked back at the men and say, where were we? And they, of course, freaked out. They jumped back and they were running, you know, and, they, and when they calmed down, the other bandits saw this and they took off into the darkness. No one wants to be next. No one wants to be next. <laughs> exactly. So they said, but Lama, you, um, <laughs> you're telling us all this about peace and love and stuff. You just took the head off somebody. He said, oh, no, not me, the Tao. What do you mean the Tao took the head off somebody? What are you talking about? He said, I was not conscious of this act. This was done in what is known in Chinese as wu wei. Spontaneous, it happened, it's done, it's over, move on. He said, now, if I had seen this bandit, and then I had given him an opportunity, I might could have scared him away. If he had seen that I was dangerous and run away, if I had chased him and pursued him and killed him, this would have been wrong. But in the moment, this is what was right. To me, that reminded me of a lot of the old stories I heard when I worked at Six Flags from an old Texas Ranger out there named C.V. Allen about gunfighters. And, you know, how it would be an instantaneous thing. You don't think of it, you just draw and shoot. You know, and the samurai went exactly the same way. There's a famous story, I'm sure you know, of the samurai that had his retainer killed, and he spent many, many years searching down the killer, found him one day on a bridge. The killer approached him. He approached the killer. The killer looked at him with disgust and spat in his face, and the samurai sheathed his sword and walked away. And his friend with him said, what? you had him there. You had him there. Why didn't you take him out? And he said, he made me angry. When I am calm, he will die. <laughs> and to me, that's the same concept. And so if you call it that Zen and the art of murder, it's like it's a meditative thing. It happens at the moment. It's as if something else is moving through you. 
you do it, it's over with, and you wonder what happened. Well, a phrase I always teach all my students is learn technique becomes instinctive reflex yes. through repetition. Science for many years would say, well, human beings don't have instincts. They have reflexes. Oh. And I would sit there and say, then why do you call it a survival instinct? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, so uh, uh, I think through the repetition training out there gets to a point where you don't have time to consciously contemplate. Oh, no. If you have time for that, you have time to walk away. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, it's a very, like I said, it was a really enjoyable article. And, and, and what you. was really great was the diversity of your articles. Um, I remember another important article which really reinforced a, a hand strike of all things I had learned years ago was your article on Dimmock. And at ah. the time, oh Dimmock, or as the Mandarins call it, Tian Shui, mm -hmm. was not a popular, it, it was known of, but outside of like a, two pages in the world's deadliest fighting secrets with a timetable and occasional references in Chinese films, you really didn't hear a lot, and you were one of the no. first people in this country to really write an article on Dimak, on the death touch, talking about the various internal organs. Um, I remember years ago um, going to the New England Institute of Acupuncture and wanting to find out more about Dimak, and I got the first textbooks, and there, plain as day, was treatments for different ailments, and at the bottom, you don't do these pressure points and in this order because it does about <laughs> And boom, there yeah, was there Dim Mock in like yeah. the first month of training in acupuncture. I was like, there it is. There it is. Now you have to just know what the martial applications of the strikes to cause adverse effects. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really fascinating. Um, what was the impetus to write that article? I did, I'd been asked about the concept of pressure points and my focus on that article never quite made it exactly. They edited it a little bit more than I wanted. Uh, the focus was, after that, by the way, uh, I, I had a contract from that point on that I give first look at every editing thing before it goes into the magazine from that point on. Um, and they also kept republishing that article and never paid me for it. It, was, it ended oh, up in you? Germany, in uh, Spain. <laughs> it, was, it was even translated into Arabic. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that one article. I, you know, people keep sending me stuff. But anyway, the articles... The, the point of that article was a lot of these things they called acupuncture points are useful for that, but a lot of the early people who discovered these things simply used those like a road map that actually is doing something else. It's actually affecting the blood pressure, it's actually affecting the internal organs with a vibration or something of that nature. It's creating a hematoma that's going to close off a blood vessel. Uh, it's doing that, and that's kind of what I was getting into. And the editor didn't like that that much. In fact, there's a picture in there of me putting out a candle. And <laughs> there were three pictures in that original article. The one was my hand here, then the other one was my hand coming down, and the other one my hand doing this, and the candle going out. The only one that made it in the magazine was me there and the smoke coming out of the candle. And the caption, which I did not write, said, Dr. P or John Painter puts out candle with his chi. I had a conniption wow. fit when I saw that. I said, because if there's anything I'm <laughs> not into, it's that. Right. You know, it, it was, I was saying in the article, you need to develop enough speed to get enough power into the fist or the palm so that you can create, because speed and, and momentum and weight, that's what creates force, period. So if you get enough to where you can put out a candle that quick, then you can hit somebody and cause some serious damage if you want to. You know, but yeah, it was an it was an interesting article, but it came back to haunt me, oh, over God. and over again. <laughs> um, another article that I found interesting over the years was uh, um, way back in its infancy, as you remember from Inside Kung Fu, they would have Chinese character writing, mm -hmm. and Ted Wong would sit there and he'd do different characters and how to do the individual. And Daniel book. Lee, Dr. Daniel, Daniel Lee, Lee my Dr. good Daniel friend. Lee. Uh, and um, they were the people that really, and, and in the ninth, and then unfortunately it went to disuse. Uh, in, in the magazine, and then you did a resurgence by your article, which mm -hmm. by the way, which th was the first article in that decade, in that time frame, on Chinese calligraphy in yes. regards to the martial arts. Yes, one of my hobbies has been to take as many of the older manuscripts I can get on Chinese martial arts that are written in the old style characters, because the new style characters do not really show you what the original meaning was of these words. For example, the word chi, which everybody bandies about today, is actually a picture 
Okay, it's, a, it's an ideogram yes. of a three-legged stove with rice cooking inside cooking. and the pot lid being popped up by the steam. So it indicates an unseen force, not some third force, I mean fifth force outside of nature, but it indicates something that's strange and we don't quite understand. And I wanted to explain that because one of my hobbies was to take these characters that the Chinese teachers had written down in their own writing and dissect them and say, no, what does this mean? Why did he choose this particular character over all the others that are possible for this? It had to have a reason. You know? And so that's helped me personally to do what I think is understand more and more about the way the Chinese masters wrote some of these things down. Now sometimes they would actually use an inappropriate character because they didn't want the profane to figure out what they were writing about and their students would know what means this other character. There's the two major characters that are very much misunderstood um, are the one I mentioned, Qi, okay, and the other one is Dao, sometimes T-A-O or D-A-O, and everybody talks about how mysterious and mythical that is. It's just a picture of a shaman wearing deer antlers and a foot. It simply means the way a wise guy, or a wise, no, I shouldn't say wise guy because I worked for the mafia once. I, it's, <laughs> it's, it's the way that, a, it's a way that an, an intelligent man will walk or person. So it means the path of wisdom. You know, there's, um, there's an interesting story I learned when I was learning Chinese calligraphy. And in the story, they, uh, they're talking about the person who wrote the first characters and whatnot. And they was like, how do I draw something that you can't see. Okay, if we translate it as air, how do I see air? And the story goes that he's in a, in a, in a cold restaurant, and they hand him a hot piping bowl of rice, and he sees the steam, and he goes, mm -hmm. the steam rising. There you go. Rice. Yeah, steamed rice. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, again, since that time, you've gone on to be very prolific in, exp in expanding, expounding upon Bagua. Um, you had a, uh, a, a series of uh, two, to two texts out on, the, on your on your Bagua system, as well as a series of videos at the time through unique publications. Yeah, we had six of those. Uh -huh. Now, uh, uh, as, I, as I go through, and I, why Jiu Long? Why the, 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 the six, why the, the nine dragons? Okay. The Li family's Bagua Zong, as I said, is a little different. It, it, they claim that it evolved from a different place, from Sichuan province and not from where uh, Dong Hai Chuan was in Beijing. So the, the, the validity of that I, don't, I can't sure. speak to. They called it nine dragon, eight diagram palm. Okay, there are eight palms. All right. In this particular system, each one of these palms, heaven palm, lake palm, mountain palm, so on, are actually many martial arts. So uh, I think it's, uh, is it Gao style? That also is similar to that. Mm -hmm. But this style, you spend two or three years learning just the heaven palm. It has nine spe spe specific positions. And you learn how to strike, neutralize, throw, lock with that particular hand position or movements. And then you do the rest with all eight of them. Now, once you have all eight of them, you then combine number one and number two and now you're doing, if you're looking at the I Ching, let me back up a little bit. If you're looking at the I Ching, you have a set of three lines, and there are eight sets of three lines. Right. All right. To make the book the I Ching, you take those and you put one over the other one and make 64 combinations. All right. So they use the I Ching to talk about the power or the energy of this particular palm. For example, heaven is basically um, like dad, who's like, you want what? You know, it's this kind of attitude, like, you know, it's got attitude. Earth is this coiling and twisting, like mom, like, oh, whatever, and she just spins out of the way. So you take on this emotional attitude along with the palm, which most other Bhagwazang systems do not do. Some have animal ideas, but right. they don't do this. And it takes time to get to know this particular attitude, this particular dragon. So they said there were eight dragons. And the way Mr. Lee would talk about it, we were kids, of course, 
you know, he would say, okay, you go, you knock on the door. I do his, this silly voice because it puts him right here beside me. Okay, it, it's how I remember his voice. So I'm not making fun of him, it's, no. it's, he's alive. So he says, okay, you knock on the door. The heaven dragon, he say, okay, come in. So you go in, he show you many things. When you are very good, he says, knock on that door. So you knock on this door. Now the earth dragon, he say, come in. And you go through this thing. <coughs> so when you get through all eight of these things, you now have 64 ways to combine them. When they stop doing that and they become all one, then that's the ninth dragon. And so you don't know whether it's earth, fire, lake, water, wind. You don't know what's coming out. It's spontaneous. It becomes woo-wee. Spontaneous without pre-thought. So there are no prearranged sets. There are no forms like kata in these arts. You're learning to imagine your opponent, whether you're doing linear or circular, and we walk first around one series of circles, and then we walk around two, and then three, and then six, and then, and then finally nine posts are in the ground, and you're weaving in and out around them very rapidly, dealing with multiple opponent concepts. And again, we, you also mentioned about the Bagua apparatus, the Bagua pole. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a wonderful depiction with the plum blossom stumps yes. in mm -hmm. the eight triagrams and walking the circle with it for the, for the, the circle stepping. Um, you know, when people look at Bagua, and I, 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 have to, I, I saw this the other day, and uh, I have to admit, I did the two things you don't do during sex, point and laugh. Mm -hmm. And what this was about <laughs> were the 10 martial arts that don't work. Mm -hmm. And of course, they lived in the Aikido and they listed Bagua. And I couldn't stop laughing because I sat there. This person has no clue what Bagua is about. Uh, in my martial arts career, I was very honored and privileged to learn Ying Fu Bagua and learn about the Gao system and uh, through, uh, Ying, through, through uh, Ying Fu through uh, Wutang. Mm -hmm. And I have never had so many people that I have fought and sparred against literally take off their sparring gear, throw them on the ground, and walk away in complete disgust because either they couldn't touch me or I was behind them the next thing. You're or not I was playing, playing fair. Th ain't playing fair. And that's <laughs> what I would hear. Yeah. You're not playing fair. What do you mean fair? And, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I would say, you know what the difference between fair and, and, and effective is? He goes, what? Application. Mm. You know, and, and I was like, um, Bagua really opened my mind to the important point. And mm -hmm. people having no clue, working on that straight line, well, having to deal with the You circle. can blame the Chinese communists for that, the way that people are laughing at it, because the original stuff, there are very few of us left who actually learned from people who learned before the communist revolution, before they took in and created the sports ministry where they started watering down all the Chinese martial arts. They actually made stances wider, larger, um, they made people lock their arms out when they were striking, which is an absolute no-no in all internal systems. They did all of this kind of stuff in order to weaken it because the people rebelled when they told them they couldn't practice their martial arts anymore. So they created a kind of a, a gymnastic version of it, which is wonderful athletes, fantastic athletes, and I have some very good friends that are amazing at it. But I would not take them in an alley in South Dallas with me if I needed somebody at my back. I would take Charlie, the director of our school here in Boston, with me, but I certainly would not take any of these people because they have no practical experience and their art is made for display and for aesthetic beauty and so on. But when you find somebody who learned from some of these older guys prior revolution, and they're not many, they're dying off very fast. Now you're talking about a seriously damaging martial art. Oh, yes. I mean, if you do this correctly, the stuff we're doing, when he throws a punch, I've already broken your elbow and your wrist before I've actually punched you. So it's, it's not for toy, it's not for toying around. And that's the stuff you don't see very much anymore. You see a few. Johnny Kwong Ming Lee. One of my good friends. I, I just saw him last year in Texas at the Last Man Standing event, 
and I made his day because yeah. I walked in and said, let me tell you about all the official karate issues. Let me tell you about the white leopard. Let me tell you about how low your horse stance is when you wield double hook swords. Let me tell and his face I'm just sure he was lit happy. up. I said, I've been wanting to meet you for a quarter of a century and you have just made my existence. You want to make Thank him you. even more next time you see him, say, let's go get some jazz and some crawfish and he'll be really happy. Oh gosh, down in Louisiana, rock he, and roll. Oh yeah, he, well, it's where he lived well, for right, quite some time. Yeah. I used to stay at his house. We'd throw each other around the tables and stuff. Um, he's one of the really good guys. When he first came to the U.S., he jumped up in, the, in, in New York, went into boxing gyms and jumped up in there and said, who wants some? And, you know, he, he, he's really good. There's a few like that. There's Bruce Kumar Francis and some others oh, sure. that are, have skills that are really martial skills. And there's uh, some of the others I don't know, the newer ones today. But the ones in tournament stuff, they're good. They have some power, but they're, they're not street fighters. That's the difference. Well, well, speaking of which, let's let's talk about very important. You were one of the first people in this country to really advocate and teach Bagua to law enforcement. Yes. How did all that come about? <laughs> well, we had a school. We have we've had three basic incarnations of our school. Um, one of the first ones called the Kung Fu Dao Training Center when we first opened it. I had a couple of cops, and they had been uh, to a domestic. Uh, that's where man and woman get mad at each other and they have to go separate them and so on and so forth. They had been to this domestic situation and one of them got clocked in the head with a frying pan as soon as she put the handcuffs on the husband. The wife hit him. And they're going, you know, we're not really trained in dealing with multiple people. And I said, well, you need to learn this, this stuff I'm showing you here. And they said, well, it's too complicated. There's too, it takes too long. And you want us to meditate and do all this other stuff. And I said, yeah. I said, well, no. So the guys went out, and I didn't think about it for a couple of years, and then I heard that one of them got killed at a, at a traffic stop where he had um, gone over to ask about the license, and the other guy had snuck around the back, and then it was two on one, and the next thing you know, he was dead. And I said, you know, I've got to figure a way to present this um, because I'd done it to some bodyguards before, so a couple of friends of mine, an old Texas Ranger and another guy that was in the uh, uh, law enforcement at the time, um, started a program called the American Rangers Law Enforcement Marshal Training Institute. That's a, wow. you can look it up, American Rangers Law Enforcement Marshal Institute dash dot com. <laughs> so wow. it's there. And um, it's actually American Rangers dash dot com. Uh, we started looking at ways to modify this so that it could be used like they would do in the Chinese Army. I right. got the clue from my teacher when they taught Chiang Kai-shek, some of their right. people. They didn't have time to stand around and look at trees forever, you know, and all that. So we modified it and we called it, <laughs> this is our little joke, we called it PKC. Pa Kwa Chang. <laughs> <laughs> but, <Crown Wilkes. laughs> but we called it in English uh, physical knowledge control. PKC. Now, Charlie is one of our people in the Rangers, and he teaches um, some of the bodyguards and other people in Boston. Um, so we started doing that, and one thing led to another, and the next thing we know, um, I got asked to be on the Phil Donahue show yeah. right after the Rodney King incident. Yeah. And um, I actually did a demo on the, on the, on the uh, Donahue show. Um, of our stuff and people saw it and liked it and the next thing you know we were getting calls from uh, departments all over the country can you come show us this and so on and so forth and then I met a fellow up in Toronto when I was doing a workshop and he was talking about you know well, this is hand to hand stuff I said no 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 the method I teach you can apply to your taser your baton your handgun everything I said, it's commonality of presentation. It's one thing for all. And so we had distilled it down into two or three basic moves. And right there in the restaurant, without a firearm, I showed him how to use his coffee cup to do a draw and shoot. And the next thing you know, we were doing all the sheriffs and the people in um, Ohio and other states um, teaching the, sh the shooting method as well. So the Rangers kind of grew from that. Excellent. You know, again, you've had, you've had such a diversified career, and, you know, we talked about so many different aspects. Uh, a couple of things that I wanted to ask you, because of being a, a Bhagwan practitioner, among other arts that I do, um, 
Bagua weaponry. Mm -hmm. Now, there's, there's a simple phrase we always say. If we can find the wildest, craziest thing to pick up and hit somebody <laughs> with, they do bagua. Yeah. Uh, from the Bagua you know, Dao, it, which is like right six, here. right, exactly. <laughs> from the Bagua Dao to the Elkhorn knives, to the uh -huh. rooster razors, to the yeah. chicken knives. I mean, Bagua's got some pretty funky weaponry. Yeah. But I notice in your particular tradition, you don't really tend to use a lot more of the more exotic weaponry. No. Leland Dao um, didn't really even talk about those things. He didn't show us much of that. We looked at, when we, when we were young, you gotta remember this is, you know, 60 That's years right. ago. Right. What we had available to us were machetes, um, farm implements, you know, <laughs> hoes, stuff like that, stabs. Um, we whittled, um, we whittled swords out of wood, and we got kitchen knives and used elbow knives, which is what we're famous for is the elbow knives. And um, we used that kind of thing. We used a, like a nine-section whip. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, I, we made um, also rope darts and so on, these rope darts and so on and so forth. But these were mostly concealable, pr practical weapons you could carry with you. And we also, he also got some um, wood and whittled out little models of broom handle Mauser pistols and taught us how to aim and shoot like his dad and he used to do. He told a lot of stories about those. The Chinese adopted that broom handle Mauser 7.63 millimeter uh, from the Germans because they didn't want it. They took the Luger instead, and the Chinese army is the one that used the Mausers the most. That's an odd looking pistol, but I love it. I've got two of them, and I just love them. Cut a moment, sorry. I thought I'd shut this off. I heard it, I thought we'd go through this. I'm sorry, let me just. Uh, it's okay. I just thought about mine, too. Hello, I'm surprised you even got through. Unfortunately, I'm running the middle of the interview, and I'm live. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm right in the middle of the interview. We're live, and I just where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Can you hear me? Can you hear All me right. now? Okay. If you want to come down on my cable. Well, actually, you can give me a call. Give me a call, okay? All right. You got it. See you in a bit. My apologies. That's all right. I had forgotten to turn mine off, too, so. <laughs> Not a problem. Okay, so we're going to go from the broom handle model yeah. comment. And give me a second here. We'll just give a second, five second countdown and go from there. And then we've got two more questions and we'll wrap it up. Now, let me explain but before we go on. Um, we have two versions of my show. On cable, on our various cable systems, we're limited to a 30 minute segment. So we'll edit this down slightly. However, because of my agreement with YouTube, the complete interview will air in that format, including photos from, the, from your articles over the years cool. and numerous things. So we have no time mm -hmm. restriction regarding that. That's why sometimes if I go a little bit over, it's okay because that'll work on I can YouTube. mail you a couple of the IAM magazines if you want to see them. Oh, you bet. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. definitely. All right. So again, Martial Arts Today Television, John Painter interview, scene one, take two. We're on five, four, Three, two. So again, again, the broom handle Mauser, which yeah. by the way, I'm, I'm a big fan of the broom handle Mauser, ironically from, of all things, a comic book. Uh huh, uh, which one? Uh, the classic uh, Walt Simonson drawn artwork of Paul Kirk's Manhunter back from yes, the 1980s. Yes, yes. And he had a broom handle Mauser with right. the classic attachment and even the old. And Han Solo had one too. And, <laughs> right, it only meant it's like a Han shot first, thing. remember. Right. But, uh, <laughs> Wow, that's, that's fascinating in regards to the, to, to the weaponry and the orientation. I saw this wonderful picture of you with a set of double Chinese broadswords, which the like I had never seen before with the large ring pommel mm -hmm. and whatnot. We've got to talk about that. I want to find out. But um, the other important aspect, again, you're here in Boston doing a series of seminars. You've been doing seminars here for over 10 years now? Yeah, about 10 years. I've had a school um, here in Boston in Chinatown with the Nam Pai Group, and it's run by Charlie Pascarillo. Um, and uh, he's... Um, doing a great job and we come up uh, like once or twice a year and we travel to all of our different schools around the world once or twice a year. I'm getting a little old for that traveling but it's fun. Yeah. This man does not look his age and anyone who tells you he does are lying. It's, it's incredible. You're in incredible shape. Um, 
Of course, one of, the, one of the topics you're doing over the course of this weekend is one of my favorite aspects to talk about regarding Bagua, and that has to be Bagua Chinna. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, the, for a moment, tell us about what separates Bagua's application of Chinna as opposed to other martial arts. Oh, Chinna means seizing and locking or, or holding. And um, what we're really going to work at on this is practical street concepts. Um, <coughs> We, when we were doing the PKC work and the police training, one of the first things an officer has to do is put a guy down on the ground without harming him, put him in handcuffing position and take him in so he doesn't hurt the guy. So we specialize in using armbar concepts um, with that and a way of entering into the person when they're either punching at you and it doesn't matter whether it's a hook or up, down or this way or whatever direction. Um, putting them into something like that and getting them in that position. We don't usually use, that's one of the unusual things about our method, we don't put somebody in a lock and make them say uncle. Uh, my experience in Hawaii was with some of the big <laughs> Hawaiian guys, I watched a guy one time get in this lock, yeah, you know, this cranking it down on him. There's a point when your nervous system goes, okay, I don't feel this anymore. And I watched this cop holding this big kahuna down like this, and he just goes, <laughs> you know, and I mean, the cop just eyes are this big, and, and he just took him down, took the policeman on, to the ground. <laughs> the same thing when we go to the border and they use pepper spray. You don't use pepper spray on the border in Texas. <laughs> I watched the guy jerk pepper spray out of the guy's hand one day and go, <laughs> use it like a mop. Yeah. Yes, ah, not hot enough, no caliente. So <laughs> So, so what we're looking at is, first of all, I have, in, in all my years in the martial arts and in realistic combat, I have yet to see but one time anybody grab anybody by the wrist to do anything. Really? Yeah. It just doesn't happen. But there are whole books written on it, what to do about it. They grab you here, they grab you here, they pull on you, you know, they push on you, so on. But we'll talk about that, grabbing you by the wrist. And so there's so many made up things that are supposed to happen in that. We're gonna take it to a next level and say, what happens when he grabs your lapels? What happens when he grabs your arm? What happens when he tries to put you in a lock? What happens when he's trying to grab you by the head? What are you gonna do? How do you move? How do you spin? And it all has to do with walking and turning. And then, <laughs> Once I get through with showing everybody about how to hold somebody by the wrist and how to get out of it, I'll show them the final thing, which is the end of the program. And that's where you just make a tiny little movement and they have to turn loose no matter what you do. And that's the one that I had some famous chin knot people at a workshop one time say, I'm doing a chin knot workshop after you, please, I'll pay you anything. Don't show, Don't show that. that one. <laughs> And I, you would know who that was if I told you his name, and I can't do it. I, you know what? I have a haunting suspicion. It's only like one of a handful of people, and I'll bet you I get it on the first guess. Yeah, but he's, and he's a good friend, so yeah, I didn't, yeah, I didn't so show it. That, and after it, I said, y'all come back afterwards, and I'll show you. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, I, you know, first of all, and he's off camera right now, but I have to thank Sheriff Charles. You know, if it weren't for him getting in touch with you, making the time for you to come down here to New Bedford, um, literally answering one of my Bagua dreams to, to oh, finally I get to meet that. you. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, my final question I ask all my interviewees, what does the future hold for you in the martial arts? Uh, the future in the martial arts is that um, at the present time we're getting ready to open our online Bagua University, which is going to be, it, right now it consists of over 200 hours almost of video lessons in the entire Nine Dragon system. And the first reincarnation of it is going to be uh, the martial part. The second will be the healing and the health part, which helped me get better. Sure. And then we'll open, after that, the Lee Family Xing Yi University online. And I'm not going to do Tai Chi because Tai Chi is on every street corner. So, um, I mean, I like Tai Chi. It's fine. We do it. I teach it. But it's not what, you know, I wanna, I'm known for so much. <clears throat> the Bagua Zong is something that I... I want to do, and I'll tell you exactly, you asked me a while ago, if you got a second, of why course. I'm actually teaching Bhagavad Zang. Okay. First of all, I love it, okay? I would do it rather than anything else. But in the Lee family, we had 
Tai Chi, Bagua Zhang, Xing Yi Tran. They have a thing called Tibetan snake boxing, which is a ground fighting system, which is very similar to, um, and I did a video on that, which is um, very similar to like Pinjok Silat mm. ground fighting. <coughs> and then there's a thing called uh, Ching Ti Hao, or um, Tibetan Blue Heron, which is a, a pressure point attack methodology. And I, I can teach all of those. Um, <coughs> When I first started getting ready to do my school, I had been a magician, you know, and um, appeared on Phil Donahue and, uh, not Phil Donahue, but um, uh, what was his name, the guy that, uh, I can't think of his name right now, I had a big TV show, Mer Merv Griffin, and a bunch of other, and in the Hollywood Castle and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> I went to a friend of mine who was a magician, <clears throat> and I said, um, as a magician, I can't get arrested, I'm not getting any good parts. You know, I'm not getting into any clubs. And he said, well, it's because you do too many things. He said, you, you list yourself as a comedian, a magician, an escape artist, a mentalist. He said, nobody knows what category to put you in. I said, okay, that's good advice, I think. So he had my brochure, and he said, pick a niche that nobody's filling and own it. So that's what I did. I became an escape artist, <coughs> and I was very well known all over the country as an escape artist. I mean, I was on the front page of the Dallas Morning News. I did all this other stuff, um, national news, hanging upside down like Houdini with the, you know, in the straight jacket and all that. Been. Well, when I started doing the martial arts, I had all these things to choose from. And I looked around, I said, black belt? A guy named Jim Keenan wrote an article on Bagua Zhang. <clears throat> a guy named T.Y. Pang wrote an article on Bagua Zhang. Robert W. Smith had written a book on Bagua Zhang. <clears throat> There was no articles. I said, there's a niche nobody's filling. So I actually started writing the articles on Bagua Zong because of that. Wow. And then went into doing the Bagua Zong more. I was, that was my personal art of choice anyway. But I was looking for what would keep the doors open. I mean, when you're running a 6,000 square foot school, you know, you gotta have enough people to keep the doors open and to feed your family. <clears throat> so Bagua Zong was very little known at the time. And I'm told that I helped to popularize Bagua Zhang in the United States. Oh, definitely. Wow. You know, so uh, made a lot of friends, made a lot of enemies, you know, both. But um, it's been good to me. It's been good to my family. Um, it's been good to me health-wise and spiritually. So it's been a great, um, a great ride, and my goals for the future are to do the university. Um, I'm not going to be traveling as much in the future. I'm going to have, we have a very beautiful training facility in Arlington, Texas. It's actually at my home, <clears throat> and um, we have an outdoor training area with all the nine posts. We've got cabins for people to stay in, and my instructors who teach for me around the world come in and stay with me, nice. and they train with me there. So. Well, last question, why the Gompa? Ah, <laughs> well, <clears throat> the Lee family's original teacher, uh, Lama Zerdwan, right. was a Tibetan. A lot of their philosophical concepts are summed up in their four virtues of honesty, humility, patience, and sincerity. That's their wuda. The Lama was imparting to them a lot of what you would call, um, today you would think of it as possibly Bon-related uh, philosophy from the Tibetan, and a thing called Dzogchen. Uh, and so a lot of their way of dealing with emotional concepts comes out of Tibet and not out of China as much. And in Tibet, a lamasary or a uh, monastery is called a gompa, oh. which actually translates loosely as place of quiet study. And so I was looking when I built this place for a place away from everything, cloistered, not a commercial open, you know, uh, uh, shopping mall thing like I'd had for 30 years. I wanted something private something where I could bring people who were really seriously dedicated and I could pick and choose what I wanted to teach. So that's why we call it the Gompa. Excellent. Yeah. Well, again, here with uh, literally one of the uh, modern legends in this country promoting the art of uh, Bagua, mm -hmm. we're here with John P. Painter, and we'll be back with some exciting action here on Martial Arts Today Television. Stay tuned. Hi, this is John Painter, and we're here at the Nam High School with our instructor here, Charlie Pascarillo, Pascarello, I should say correctly. I wish he changed his name to Smith. But anyway, Charlie is one of my high-level students, and he teaches our classes here in Boston. 
uh, here at the Nanpai Academy in downtown Chinatown. We're very pleased to have this in downtown Chinatown. We have schools, as you might know, all over the world, um, but this one, my favorites to come to and to play in because we got a lot of great guys that come and work with us. And this weekend, we're doing a workshop on Bagua Zhang Chinna, which is locking and controlling and escaping and learning how to use soft energy to do that. And Charlie teaches classes in what's called, what's called Dragon Rolling the Pearl. And that's the beginning basic principles of the Bagua Zhang in the Lee family system. He also goes into the palms. What palms are you teaching? Uh, so right now we're focusing on five palms. Fire palm, okay? So we take each one of the palms and use them for almost a year's study. Each, in our system, the palms are different, so you end up getting a movement out of a palm that has about nine different positions, and with every palm, you can do locks, you can do throws, you can do strikes, you can do takedowns, and so on. So you study all nine of those ideas and then get into the other eight palms, and you've got tons of combinations of things you can do. And Charlie has a good group of students here, and if anybody's out there interested, they're welcome to come join his class or come visit us at the GOMPA, G-O-M-P-A, at AOL.com uh, in Arlington, Texas. So either way, come see Charlie, come see me, anywhere to get into Bagua, walk the circle. Okay. No fancy stuff. This kind of thing, this, and this, and this, and this. He's already knocked me out three times. All right, just roll it. Control it and move it. You follow? Okay, so he's here. Lean. There it is. Boom. Snap the arm. Strike him out. Oh, look. I'm in a vulnerable spot. Hit me in the kidney. No. <laughs> what happened when he went to my kidney? Look, look. If I stood there, he's going to punch me in the kidney. He's going to hurt, right? This way. All right, now he's got this, he's got this. I can try this kind of stuff too, but I can't do much. He's trying to push me into the wall. Fine, all right? Flow, think, control. He's over there, I'm over here. You have to keep moving. If you try to push him or stand still, <coughs> you're fighting with him. Just roll with whatever he's giving you and control him and move him where you want him to go. Okay? This way. It's coming out of the whole body, not just the arm. Does that make sense? Hey, Charlie, you do one. Do one with one of these guys. <laughs> yep. Yeah, either one. I don't care. There you go. It should look casual. Not like it's a, you know, wusu moment. It's not like Hmm, take a picture. No, it's just flow, move, change, turn, go. That's what it's about. Good enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay? Good. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. No. That's it. Turn and flow. Again? Yeah. Okay. Okay? So, when you're dealing with that, and they're in close, there's a bunch of them. Now, I need uh, you guys and you come around me. Okay, I want to get around me. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Okay. Now, I'm really screwed up, okay, because I'm right here and you're everywhere. Right? So, your leader here, fearless leader, he grabs hold of me somehow. So, now you guys are going to you know, take me out, right? Okay, what do I have to do with him? Fight him? No. Uh -uh. What I need to do is when he grabs me, is use him against all of you and turn and change <laughs> so you can keep moving until I get you this way. Now you got to come here. This is what I call from the Western version of Samson at Lehi. <laughs> I'm going to get in the corner, get my jaw on him and I ask and whoop you all upside the head. But if I stay in here, the this is not a kung fu move. Okay, let's do it like a kung fu move. Okay, one guy's here. Get around him. Okay, now everybody do this. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Go like that. Keep going like that. Now he comes in and I fight him while y'all are doing that. See, that's not what happens in real life. In real life, you swarm me. He comes in 
you come in with him, but I'm going to use him and him and you and him and him and him and him, and I'm back out here again. I'm going to walk in and around you. That's what the nine post thing's all about. I'm not going to stand here toe to toe with you while he punches me in the head. Okay? That's why all the search went. Come here. So you're starting to punch. He's in, he's in there too. Well, what am I doing? I'm going to put you in the head. See? Oh, your buddy's there. Watch out. <laughs> there he is. You follow? Yes. See what I mean? So control. If all of you reach in and touch him with your hands, touch with your hands, push him. See? I can't get away. I can't get away. Ah. If I have connected body energy, then I just slowly turn. <laughs> and all move. See? So if you all try to grab me at once, I'm going to move that whole body, and you're going to spin off like trying to grab a spinning tire. Does that make sense? Yeah. See? If i got a boxer over here, and he's a boxer and he's coming in there, I'm not going to play boxer out here, walking circle. No, this is linear time. He's throwing those punches, I'm right here, in his face. See? He's got nothing left. See? Then that's knee, kick, punch, and he's out. Most Bagua guys can't deal with boxers. So they try to stay out here. Block that punch, block this, block. They're playing his game. What did I do? I crowded him where he doesn't have his boxing skills. Look at my left knee. See? Here. See? Here. See? I crowded him mm. up against him. Like that. He wants me at that distance right here. You follow? He wants me at that distance. I don't want to be there. I either want to be too far or too close. See, in here. Look at this leg. See? Right here. See, I caught him in the leg. Okay? Thank you. They're trying to keep me from doing this. Right? So what do I do here? Struggle, try to do a fancy move, right? Okay, step back and get ready to do that. So what I'm doing here is the same thing we did when the guy had the other. Turn, turn. They turn them into each other, control them, and then come back to the next guy. You can fold in, let me show you. Okay. I can fold in, he's pulling, so let him pull. Go with that one, loosen him up, loosen him up, control him, put him into the other guy and move. Feel what they're doing, go with their pulls and pushes, control and move, and then they'll open up for you. Try to do a set routine, <laughs> it'll fail about 90% of the time. So the art's based on movement and principles and feel. Okay? Good. We've got eight lines, two are strong, six are weak. So you don't want to push into his strong side. This is standing here. He's got weakness in the front and weakness in the back. He's strong for both sides. When he takes a fighting stance of some kind, whatever it might be, now he's strong this way and he's strong this way, but he's not strong this way. So once we understand that, if he's holding on to me, we don't want to, we don't want to fight. Relax. This pulls him. See? And when you're controlling it, then you control the balance so easily. If you can do it slowly, you can do it quickly. Okay? But don't try to do it quickly at first, because you're going to miss all the nuances of what's going on. He's holding me. Okay, look. Where does this start? In my body first. In my foot, up into my arm. Then he moves very easily. If I just try to use my arm, then I'm fighting him and myself and everything else. Look at him. See, he's doing all this stuff. He's had that Tai Chi stuff, so he's all wiggly. All right? <laughs> but if I do the whole torso and the whole thing rotates, it's child's play to move him. You follow? So the closer I get to him, wherever I am, the more of those points I have that I can move him on. You see? I can even go from here and come behind him, and he doesn't even know where I am. See? But I have to be able to continue walking, right? Not 
do this, do this, pull him over here. He'll readjust to everything you're doing. That's why everything is one fluid motion so that he moves. Do you see that? And what we talked about last night is he's hanging on to me right now. I'm localizing. I'm feeling his touch right here. So, try to pull away. No. Instead, I dissolve. When I dissolve, I can start using my intention. You see, he's already going. I'm using my intention, and I'm moving his body, and I can move his body in all sorts of different directions without any great amount of force. I'm not using any more force here than it takes to move six ounces. That's in the Tai Chi classic, six ounces with a thousand pounds. That's what this means. Now, obviously, I cannot push back into his strong point, see? Right? Even if I'm soft and relaxed, pushing into a strong point is silly. Fill him up with my intention and guide him gently wherever you want him to go. You follow? If I touch him, here, no hard push. Relax into it. Control the balance. You follow? So he's here. Again, lock. I'm locking him here. Break this here if you want to. But there's his weak spot. See that line? That's where he's going to go. And that's how I'm going to get him out of the way from That's what make it look like I'm using some internal power or something. It is because it's mental. But it's also based on physics. And once you understand the physics of what's happening, then you just match and feel the open places with your opponent, and then you move him where you want it to go. Does that make sense to you? Huh? Okay. It doesn't matter whether it's punch, kick, or whatever he's doing. Your control is balance. If he kicks at me here, I'm not going to block it. Kick me right here. That's it. See? Yeah, I'm not going to block that and then try to. He's going to go to the back fist, right? Boom. And if you kick me, then what's going to happen? Bow. Right? Okay. So what happens? He does this. Okay. Use the lines again. Do you see him? Look. So. See? There it is. Now, if I keep lifting this, it's going to fall on his head. Right? So I'm just basically going to take it there, and I'm already on top of him, and I can put it wherever I want him to go. But it's done in a very soft, relaxed, fluid manner. It's not boom, 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 like that. It's like a big rolling ball full of water. It's constantly rolling down the hill. Catch on? Right. And then the games are all about playing these things to figure out where his balance is, where it isn't, and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? Okay? All right. So let's go back and work on this idea. Okay? Let's have your friend do something else. All right, let's have him come back here. Okay? And plan on you like he's going to spin you around. To punch you like he's going to do this. Use your left hand on his right shoulder. He's going to swing you around and punch you, right? Okay, so he does that here. Okay, now he's going to pull me around and going to punch me in the face. Boom. Okay, so he does that. Just do this. Let's look at it again. Okay, here I feel the pull, right? And this comes up. He's already neutralized. You see it? I'm locking his elbow. See, this is the lock. As I keep turning with my boss step, this comes into where I want it, however I want it, and then shove it away from me or do damage to it if I choose. If I want to choose to do damage to it, then I do this really hard to break his elbow right here. Hyperextend it. Bang. And as he's falling that way, come back and hit him this way. As you move. Does that make sense? Okay, let's look at that slowly. Here, I feel the pull. Don't do this. Your ordinary idea is to go like that, right? Don't do that. Go with that move. See? Here it is. You're already there. Now I got this, and then this, and this. You catch on? So here's the move. Look. Okay. Just flow, burn, move. See? Okay? Simple, beautiful, effective. We'll try. Slowly, slowly, 